Well, hello. Nice to see you again. If you've been uh, what, keeping up with Chimwag and watching, I've had some lovely comments and thank you all so much for them. I do love reading them and thank you. Um, well, yes. I'll, I'll come back in a minute, see if I can get a shot of them. Bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover come to mind, don't they? Hang on. Oh, that's better. Well, my name is Penny. I live uh, in the southeast of England with my husband Pete and my five chickens. So welcome back or welcome if it's your first time. Um, so it's a little bit about crafting. Uh, Pete's got his own piece and a little film. I'm not seeing mum this week. Well, I am seeing her. I see her every day. But this week, no, because due to circumstances, we're going to film next week. So there won't be a little piece from mum. So I'm sorry. We're going to be doing about her, her dad's family next time. We've done about her mum's and next time it's about her dad's. It's quite interesting, I think. So look forward to that next time. So instead of that, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, TA, what we call TA, transactional analysis. So see what you think of that. Let me know. So where to start with the crafting? Um, I wanted to talk about how I got into crafting. Well, when you look back, I didn't do crafting, no, I didn't do crafting, no. And then I got married and out of needs must, I started making clothes and fabric was very reasonable then. Laura Ashley, Liberty, um, just, yeah, I made everything. I think I've showed you a, a shirt I made for Pete. I never made him trousers, no. But yeah, so I started making clothes, then I started doing little embroideries. I found I liked that. Then I started doing county cross stitch after I became, you know, poorly with ME and I was resting a lot. And then, yeah, knitting, got into knitting. I never really did crochet. I used to ask my Auntie May, my mum's sister, if I wanted anything crocheted. She crocheted the girls a couple of a dress each and yeah, this and that, you know, brilliant crochet, but not for not me, no. Um and then yeah, always knitting. And then because I'd done the dressmaking, when the girls left home, I thought I'll go to the local um, what do you call it? You know, like for evening class, except they were during the day. A couple of hours, you know, or a morning, whatever it was. And I enrolled for dressmaking because I thought I'll learn to do it, pucker. And when I got there and I sat there and she started saying about how she'd put a zip in and this and that thing. And I just thought, this is boring. I've done this. I want to learn something new. And so. Yeah, I don't like that light there. I'm just going to move there because I can see it. Um, I'm going to do something. I want to do something new. So I went downstairs and there was the lady in the little kiosk. I said, I don't really want to do this. Oh, I don't know what to do. So she said, well, have a look through the courses, see if there's anything else. Oh, I didn't know. And then I saw quilting. I thought, well, I might give that a go. So I went to the next quilting lesson and the teacher, I can't tell you, she was superb. She started at the beginning, where to start and showed us, explained it all. We made some super things and I never looked back and I attended for all the classes she did. She gave up in the end because she said, do you know what? For this uh, adult learning, that's what it was. For this adult learning, you have to provide so much. I have to do the whole term. What I'm going to be teaching, show them all, you know, bits and bobs, show them what I'm going to be. And it all takes so much time. So she gave up. I think her name was Pat. And uh, she ran the Abbey Patches in Manston. Or no, Minster. That's right. 
and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. And she was the one that taught me. And so I started doing quilting. Uh, well, as you know, I mean, I'm absolutely, I'm drowning in quilts. I can't tell you how many I've given away. I've just given away more quilts than I've had top dinners, really. But that's lovely. It's a lovely thing to do. And I've taught a lot of people, and that's lovely too, sharing the joy. So I wanted to show you how the joy it brought me, just one thing, because um, three years ago in December, my dad died. And uh, just before he died, he bought me a book on Amazon. I said to him, oh, dad, would you buy me this book? Because you don't pay for postage. You know, he had Amazon. What's name? Pete's cooking me tea. He always has the music quite loud. I hope it's not too loud for you. Anyway, he, uh, I, he does, you know, he had the Amazon Prime. That's it. So I said, would you buy me this book on Amazon? Oh, yes. Anyway, when I went to collect it, he was sitting at the kitchen table, as was his way. Mum and him always did the uh, Times crossword every morning. If you pop round there, you weren't really welcome until the crossword was finished. Unless he was stuck with a clue, then he'd ask you. So, yeah. And anyway, the book was there and he'd been looking through it. He was a man who loved his poetry, he loved his literature who was interested in things. Right up until the last, he was interested in things. You know, in people and in things. And he said, wow, I love this bag. I could do with it. I said, oh. He said, because he had a, he had a buggy then. He said, I could put it on the buggy. And when I go shopping, I could put all the shopping in it. So, unfortunately, I never got to make him one because he was he was poorly before, um, yeah, before I had a chance. I'll show you the bag. I'll show you the book. It's Tilda's Hot Chocolate. There's some beautiful patterns in there. Really lovely patterns. Beautiful quilt patterns. Um ones with uh, hot chocolate and marshmallows quilt. That's what it's called, hot chocolate. There it is. And, oh, lots of different quilts and lots of little projects as well, like uh, the pear and the apple and the bird. Oh, there's the quilt on the back. I'm not keen on these animals she does because they don't stand up and they're very, very thin to make these arms and legs. Not for me, not for me. However, I'll show you the bag he was referring to. It was though, that one. Applique bags. These pretty bags are spacious and great for storing all sorts of things including your fabric stash. And you make them exactly like you make a quilt. You get the backing fabric, which becomes the lining. You put the wadding on, and then you put the top layer, which is your outer fabric, and you quilt it. Quilt, 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 quilt. I did every bag by hand. Quilt along in lines and then you sew the sides together. You just take a little bit off the bottom which makes what we call a box bottom. If you just take the corners off it makes a box bottom and then you bind round the top, put the handles on and I bound uh, down the sides, yeah inside. So it's exactly the same as making a quilt, not difficult. And I decided when you're grieving, the best thing to do, I think, is reach out to people. And often our psyche says, oh no, I don't want to see people, I, I, I'm grieving, I want to keep myself to myself. And that's not a good thing. 
we need to interact with our friends. And so I did. And I decided to make everybody I love a bag. <laughs> and so I, I think I made about 24. And Anne in Ireland got one. She's my dad's sister. And that's she left a message a couple of episodes ago and said, why don't you show people your bags? Well, of course, I've given them all away. I thought about my, my two grandsons are married and I thought about their wives. They'd only just really married them and about, yeah, about six months before. They both got married closely and I thought about those girls and do you know what? I hit it just right. I did K facet for one and I did, um, I did uh, a fabric that glows in the dark, very pale pastels pinks and 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 you know what every bag I made for all the different people that I love I stuck it into a book so I've got like a photograph album I don't know where I've put that book I put it somewhere safe I'll find it but not for this episode if I do I'll show you but of course I made myself some bags so I just thought I'd show you those as Anne suggested I use them for um oh that's a special one what's the first one Oh, a John Loudon fabric. And so, as you see, sew down, bind round, put the handles on. If I turn it inside out, I can show you. How I've bound the bottom and I've bound the sides. And so it's exactly like making a quilt. So I think you got this. Oh, I'm not sure what you got. I can't remember now what I made for people. So that's one. Oh yeah, little hearts around the bottom. So John Loudon fabric that is. Shall I sit further back? What's the next one? Oh, this is a different design. So I've done whole quilt. I've done a whole quilt in this design. And the, the ruler allows you to make this quite quickly. It looks complicated, but it isn't. So that's another one. one's a special one I'll show you that in a minute oh this one's got a project in it I made this out of all Liberty scraps and that's what I mean by the box bottom you just sew along just along there like that inside and make that box bottom so that's my Liberty print just off cuts and oh I put a pocket in some of them I did some of them I didn't so that one I put a pocket in and just put a little bit of binding around the edge but that's got a jumper in a whip oh how naughty and this has got a jumper in oh I'll show you this next episode because this is a Ridari Lopi I'll show you that, it's for Pete, I'll show you that next episode. But this is Tilda fabric. And this was the fabric my dad particularly liked. Yeah, so whenever I pick up one of my bags, well, I think of him anyway, but, oh, and this one's special because my granddaughter Lois designed it for me she's ace at designing and she's ace at sewing too it's a shame because during lockdown I haven't been able to see her and I've seen her once in 18 months and um, she's now pregnant with Tommy so uh, that's the the quilt I'm going to be starting soon but before I do I'll show you and as you know we, we particularly love Tresco we particularly love Tresco and we go there 
and uh, I wanted to make a Tresco bag. Ah, oh, this has got a little thrush on it. A but uh, It's made of pottery. It's a beautiful button. I couldn't resist putting that on. So we desi we designed it together. I've got photos of us laying all the fabric out and designing, and she's come up trumps. So that's one side. Because, of course, every time we go to Tresco, we see puffins. And then I'm using uh, Liberty, the girls from Liberty, they went over to the Isles of Scilly and they designed a range of fabrics from the Abbey Gardens, which are on Tresco. And so the fabrics in this side of the bag are all from the uh, range of the Abbey Gardens. And so that's the design that Lois came up with. It's beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. And then we made the handles. I had some silk just in my stash that I'd made a, a, a complete, oh, years ago, I made a complete silk um, quilt for a client. And I had a little bit left over. And so we used those pieces to make the handles because she said, now they go and they do. So that's my special, oops, oh, that, oh, sorry about that. That's my special Tresco bag. So, oh, I wanted to show you this too. Good job we haven't got Mum's bit because Pete's done a bit and then we've got a little film and we're getting on to too late and, and somebody hadn't caught up and I said, oh, are they too long, Copper Top? And she said, too long? No way. So I thank you very much. I shan't worry about the length. Somebody else said, oh, we can only watch in sections. So yeah, that's, up. you know, that's, I'm not going to worry. I wanted to show you this fabric. So cute. I, as you can see, I've made something from it. Isn't that cute? And what I've made is this little bag. It's from designed and created by Rose Garden Patchwork. And it's the little Lulu basket purse. And it took me two hours to make. So no time at all. But shall I tell you what I do with it? When I'm knitting my socks, I keep my little ball of wool in it. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's just at the minute. I shall probably keep other bits in it. But here's the pattern. And here's what I made. Isn't it cute? It's so cute. And you can keep anything you like in it, obviously. Whatever. But I, use, I find I use it all the time. We went out for a meal yesterday lunchtime as a little treat. And um, I took my ball of wool in there. It sat really nicely. And knitted my socks while I was waiting. <laughs> because I like to do something with my hands. So there we are. I thought I'd show you that. As we're on to bags. So the next bit, I wanted to do a bit of TA. And you might say, well, what is TA? And in counselling terms, it's called transactional analysis. I'll read you the first sentence in the book um, because I think it sums it up better than I can say. Transactional analysis is a theory of personality and a systematic psychotherapy for personal growth 
and personal change. It's a bit of a mouthful. But how I got into that was, after Pete's dad died, I found that I was doing my best for him. Obviously, like you do, don't you? You know, you want to help. I wanted to, it switched oh. itself off. It often does this. It gets to a certain point and then it's gone. So, excuse me. Anyway, uh, oh yes. So there I was, you know, helping Pete through grieving for the loss of his dad. And I found, well, I was very close to his dad. Very close. And I went to the doctors and I said, I'm feeling a little bit low. This was a long time ago, 21 years ago. Counselling wasn't really like it is now. Anyway, he said, I'll send you off for some counselling. You can have six sessions on the national health. I'd never heard of counselling. I said, what is it? He said, go along and see. Anyway, I struck lucky with my counsellor. Struck lucky. And he practised TA. And... Oh, at the end of that session, I had a few more I paid privately because, you know, I needed a few more. But at the end, woo, I felt brilliant. And I thought, I'm going to go to count. I'm going, oh, shall I train? And I wanted to do TA. So I found it very helpful over the last 21 years. So I thought I'd do a little bit with you. Now, the way I teach it, is in a visual way because like you say well like I say actually not you it can be a little bit tongue tying can't can't it so I've got my little group of helpers <laughs> and I thought I'd introduce them to you one one at a time and this week it's going to be her busy bee isn't she and she you know what when people say would you do this for me? Or would you do that for me? She always says yes, straight away. Always. Yes. Without thinking. Without thinking, have I got the resources? Am I up to it? Do I want to? Yes. And she makes a rod for her own back. And she needs help, doesn't she? Now, she's the nurturing parent what we call in TA the nurturing parent because in TA think back over the past 24 hours of your life were there moments when you acted and thought and felt just as you did when you were a child were there moments when you acted and thought and felt just as your parents had taught you to just when your parent figures or other parent figures, maybe school teachers, yeah, aunts or uncles, you know, grown-ups. Let's put grown-ups. When you found yourself behaving, thinking and feeling in ways you copied long ago from grown-ups. And um, were there still other occasions in that 24 hours when your behaviour, thoughts and feelings were simply a direct here and now response to what was happening around you at the moment. On these occasions, you responded as the grown-up you are now, rather than dipping back into your childhood. So we have a model, and we say with that model, parent, parent, adult, and child. And so parent, our behaviours, thoughts and feelings copied from parents or parent figures. Adult, behaviours, thoughts and feelings, which are direct responses to the here and now. And child, behaviours, thoughts and feelings replayed from childhood. So the child is replayed from childhood and the parent is copied from childhood. And the adult is the here and now. So this lady, the parent, she's the nurturing parent. She is going straight back to her childhood when she should or must always help. It would be so wrong. She'd feel so guilty if she didn't help. 
She's copying. She learned that when she was a child. I must. Oh, that would be so wrong not to help. Nurturing parent. We call that the negative nurturing parent. Because there is another nurturing parent. I'll show you her. I was only going to show you that one, but I can't resist. I'll show you her. Unfortunately, her chair broke. So she's sitting on a toilet, so I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> but here she is. Yeah, same person, but she has to say yes. Otherwise, she thinks it's wrong. She's copying that from her thoughts and feelings and behaviours when she was young. She's copying that from the grown-ups she knew. This is the nurturing parent that we call the, the, the negative and the positive, the positive nurturing parent. Now she says, if you need a hand, just ask. She's here. If you need a hand, just ask. I'm here. So let's, let's just suppose you're the kind of person that often asking for help. And you say, oh, I want to get the um, train back to London this afternoon. I'm not quite sure where to go or what time it is. Oh, says she, I'll look it up for you. Yeah, I've got my phone here. Oh, yes, I've got train line. I'll look it up. Oh, it's four o'clock. Um, I don't, oh, they're on time. It's not, she's finding it all out. She has this compulsion before she's even thought about it to do it. This one says, Oh, I use train line. That might help. If you have any trouble, just ask. So she's still there. She's still nurturing parent, but she's not weighing herself down with this compulsion, with this feeling that I must do it or I'll feel guilty. If you need a hand, just ask. Now you think about it. This one is crediting the other person with some power. This one is taking the power away from the other person. She's saying, well, you can't really do it. You're not good enough. You don't know how to. I'll do it for you. When you think about it, this one is saying, you can do it. You've got the power. But if you need a hand, just ask. So both nurturing parent, but we want to leave this one behind and use this part of ourselves. This one, we're thinking as adults. This one, we're copying what we were taught as children. So there we are. I'll leave it there and I'll talk about it next time but if you can have a little think and if you've got any questions just leave them in the box below I'll be happy to answer them yeah nurturing parent the positive and the minus so I'll leave it there now and I'm going to go and have a chat with Pete and do Pete's piece I think it involves knives and axes so if you're a little no it doesn't really uh, he just was talking about that because he was in the scouts and in those days well I'll leave him to tell it so I'll see you in a minute bye I had to come back on because in the little film after Pete's piece is a, a kingfisher that the grainies, Andrew and Heather, we saw together. And the kingfisher is over a wintering. Let me just get you big because it's different. That's right, the kingfisher is over wintering in the harbour in Ramsgate. And so we wanted to see it. So they came down for the weekend and we saw it. We got a couple of lovely photos. In, and oh, low battery. Oh, things are happening. Anyway, I'll tell you before the battery runs out. The fascinating fact about the kingfisher. 
In pursuit of a tasty meal, it said, the kingfisher can dive into water with very little splash. Have you ever seen that? I mean, you know, it's, it's hardly a splash. And uh, the fact intrigued, or oh, I don't know how to say it, Eiji Nakatsu, an engineer who directed test runs of the bullet train. He wondered how the kingfisher adapts so quickly from low resistance air to high resistance water. Finding the answer was key to solving a peculiar problem with the bullet train. When a train rushes into a narrow tunnel at high speed, Nakatsu explains, this generates atmospheric pressure waves that gradually grow into waves like tidal waves. These reach the tunnel exit at the speed of sound, generating low frequency waves that produce a large boom and an aerodynamic vibration so intense that residents 400 meters or 1,300 feet away have registered complaints. So you've got this fantastic bullet train, but the trouble is it's going at 200 miles an hour, goes in the tunnel, comes out and makes this boom sound. So what did this guy do? Oh, Nakatsu, what did he do? He studied the beak and he patterned the front end of the train after the kingfisher's beak. The result? The bullet train now travels 10% faster, 15% less energy is consumed, and the air pressure produced by the train has been reduced by 30%. No large boom as the train passes through a tunnel. So when you think about it, a 200 mile an hour train is zooming along through and who has stopped that booming sound but the kingfisher's beak? Why? Because he goes zhunk plump. We saw him. We saw him going into Ramsgate Harbour. Whoops. And I'm sure if you've been lucky enough to see a kingfisher, you've watched him dive too. So that's the fascinating fact for this week. And of course, I'm sorry, I had to come back on to say it. So... The fascinating fact and the little piece in the film. So I'll see you later. We're doing Pete's piece and I think he's going to be talking about the Boy Scouts. And you know what? Just a coincidence, I just read this poem, so I thought I'd share it. You're it's right. called The Common Cormorant and it's by Christopher Isherwood. It says The common cormorant or shag lays eggs inside a paper bag. The reason you will see, no doubt, it is to keep the lightning out. But what these unobservant birds have never noticed is that herds of wandering bears may come with buns and steal the bags to hold the crumbs. <laughs> I know, it's like, a, it's like a, a nonsense poem, isn't it, Edward Lear? But one, a cormorant and a shag are two different birds. No, they're not. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, yes they, they are. are. Yes, they are. Yes, yeah. of course they are. Because yeah. he says cormorant or shag. Yeah. Well, um, they are two different birds. But also, what made me think about is why I linked it with the Boy Scouts was that these birds, according to his nonsense poem, was laying their eggs in this bag to keep the lightning out. But, of course, they hadn't even thought about the bears who want to steal the bags to put the crumbs in of their buns. And so it made me think, however well you prepare for eventualities in life, you can't because there's some things you just aren't prepared for. You can never think of them. And that made me think of be prepared with the Boy Scouts. Oh. So there, there we you are. Go. So, so now it's. Uh, and I'm not even going to talk about the Boy Scouts. Oh, you are. <laughs> I think he is. I think he well, is. Not, uh, Indirectly. <laughs> Indirectly? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they come into it, yeah. So what did you want to talk about? I wanted now? to talk about our move to Potter's Bar because it, it was a big moment in my life as a young boy. Okay. And it it was the best thing that ever happened. Oh, how because lovely. Because it was such a, so, such a smashing place in that, in, you know, then. So we moved from Norfolk Avenue, which is in Palms Green, North London, um, when I was eight. 
and we moved to Potter's Bar. Now, Potter's Bar then was a, quite a sprawling town, had lots and lots of open spaces, and they were all brilliant for an eight-year-old boy to to sort of investigate, and there's places to go, and and one of the best was just behind our house. Well, in actual fact, it was at the bottom of our garden, and it was a field. In actual fact, it was two fields, and there was a big hedge which started by the house, by the fences of the house, and went right down to the farmer's fields. And what was good about it was it it, it was overgrown. It was... Um, not cultivated? No, they, they, it belonged to the council and they, I think they were probably going to build or something on it or use it for something. It never happened because of the war and then it's just, it had been left. And it, would take, it, was, it was a natural wildlife area. There was a little pond halfway down this, in the hedge, which they call a dew pond, I think, which means it comes in the winter, but then in the winter it completely dries up. In the summer. In the summer, yeah. yeah. It completely, completely dries up. And, of course, this is 1953, I think. Around you, about, You were yeah. eight. And I can remember we moved in January, yeah. and uh, I couldn't wait to get have a little explore. And... Um, so the the next day after we'd moved, I got up, and though it was winter, uh, I went through the little gate at the bottom of our garden, which, went, which that was then the field, and I went and had a little mooch round. Oh, it must have been so exciting. Well, it was, and I, I went down by the hedge, and, and then, but then when I came back, I couldn't remember what house it was. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Of course you wouldn't with all no. the little gates. They were and... all seemed the same, yeah. and they all they were. It was the, the whole road, uh, that part of the road that backed onto the field, were all bungalows, semi-detached bungalows. Ah. And um, so I was wandering sort of up and down, and then just took a chance and went through one. It just happened to be the right one. But it's the sort of thing a little kid does. You, know, you run out and you're all yeah. excited and you're running up and down. Yeah. And the other thing I, I didn't even realise even then was it was two fields. The hedge separated these these uh, these fields. And, of course, uh, as I got to know, uh, that's where we used to play. And the whole street, and there were so many kids. So uh, many. Uh, you know. Um, How many in your class? Fifty. I couldn't believe that when you said yeah, 50. fifteen in our class. Well, it was part and of... they all lived. You had two next door, and oh, two over the road. And well, they weren't all the same age. I mean, no, all I mean, different next age. door to us was um, the Mosses. Uh, the, the eldest boy was a couple of years older than me, uh, and then he had a sister who was a year younger than me, and then another sister who was a couple of years young, down, younger than that. Opposite, we had the Greggs and they two girls and a boy, Malcolm Gregg, who I, who I really piled up with. He, but he was a year younger than me. So there you were. Did they all go over the fields? We all went over the all fields. There was about the twelve of us all together. Okay. Uh, and the girl, the little ones used to come as well. Yeah, the oldest would look well, after we'd, the little ones. We cycled to South Mims because you know. How far uh, was that then? Three miles. All right. And you can see South Mims from our. From the back, our back garden, right, and in between was the Barnet Bypass, which is the A1, which then wasn't even a dual carriageway. No, so just an ordinary. It was road. just a, an ordinary road, and I think they had little passing places every now and again. But we used to, and also in the evening, Mum and Dad would go, love walking, and, and they carried on loving walking even when they moved to Devon, and we used to walk to South Mims and back. For an evening stroll. How nice! And all the, the 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 road was lined by chestnut trees, horse chestnuts. So we used to get the conkers in. Oh, them. how lovely! But I mean, then you'd you'd get to the Barnet Bypass, then you just look. There's no, there wasn't even traffic light. You just walked over. Wow! And then um, got to South Mims. That's Wake Arms pub. Dad used to have a pint. Yeah. I'd have a lemonade and a packet of crisps or something. Mum would have tonic water. She didn't drink. And then we'd walk back again. And I remember one day coming back, the horse chestnuts had self-seeded. 
and I picked up three of these horse chestnuts. And when we got back, I planted them at the bottom of our garden. Uh -huh. And they grew, they all took. And uh, it was the wrong place for them, really. But they were there as long as <laughs> we were there. Yeah. And they had grown to quite about six foot, seven foot, oh, maybe, but when, we, nice. when we moved. But that was quite a long time later. But um, the, the, the field was just the main attraction, in, and mostly summer, although well, we did go over in the winter. And in between the Barnet Bypass and our back in the field, was a, there was a river. So we used to go down to the river. You had to cross the farmer's fields to get to the river, but they didn't mind too much. Farmer Rose did. He used to chase us all the time. But the other farmer, the Bridgefoot, was okay. And I've got a little job there uh, in the summer because they still had, um, uh, what do you call, reapers. You know, they, 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 they didn't have a combine. They, 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 cut, the, they cut it and they sheathed it and threw it out and then it was our job as kids to, to lift up the sheaths and make into stooks oh. and you used to see all these stooks around the fields in in the world yeah where it was for them to dry because they didn't have electric dryers like we have now and that you know they just cut it don't they the combine is all done in one and it's dryer. all done in one and then yeah. it goes to the dryer yeah and uh yeah and there was quite a few uh, people work work with the farm, and a lot of all the, us kids and the farm hands used to muck about with us. And I'm, I, one day we were all fighting and mucking about, and I got this big bloke's legs and tried to get him to fall over. And I'm on, and he lifted his foot up because they wore big hobnail boots in those days. The farmers, well, the, 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 the you know the, the helpers and that, and he got me right at the top of the eye there. That's one. One of my first um, accidents, because I, I had a two-year stint then of having accidents and had so many that the hospital, I can you my name, well, not you again, Peter, what have you done now, sort of thing. Mm. And that was a couple of years. Anyway, I digress. Um, and uh, so it was all good fun. And then in the winter, when it was too wet out there, we used to play on, in the street. And we used to play... Hopscotch. I used to like hopscotch. We used to play knock down ginger, so that, you know, knocking on the door and running away and all that. And you know, we used to throw where you threw the ball, and if you hit them, then you he joined you, and you until you everybody had been hit by the ball, and that just left one, and they won. They were the winners, sort of thing. And all stuff like that in the street. No cars. Very, very, very few cars. Milk float came now. You know the electric. And, the, and there were still horse and carts bringing some stuff. The old uh, rag and bow man used to come round in a, on a horse and cart. And then again, the Coleman used to come along in a, uh, a, a big horse and cart then, but not very often. They were mostly lorries by that time. But uh, well, the bit I was getting to was I joined the clubs, the cubs, not the clubs, I joined the cubs when I was about eight, nine, and um, got into the um, preparation for the Scouts. Then I went into the Scouts. And that's when I, uh, I started to learn about uh, woodcraft and all stuff like that. And, and of course, when you think of knives now and hatchets now, you've got a different, completely different connotation of, of uh, weapons, aren't they, really? You know, the banning knives. Well, we all had knives. We had sheath knives. I had a big sheath knife in the scout part of the uniform. And then uh, because they used to teach you how to use a hatchet, how to cut, you know, branches off trees and things to make little wigwam type things for as a shelter. That's all the sort of stuff you learn in your woodcraft one. Yeah, I think I can't remember. I don't think it was a woodcraft badge. It was some badge that you, you that's what we were trying to get. Yeah. And then, um, of course, uh, I had my sheath knife, uh, and we used to borrow the axes from the, from the, the you know, had a big trunk full of stuff like that for when you went out to places like Gidley Park. Was it Gidley Park? Was no. it Gidley Park? No, what was it called? Epping Forest. It was in Epping Forest. Gilwell. It was a big Gilwell Park. It was a big scout camp, and 
used to you know to cut wood for tree uh, for the fire and to cook your dampers and so there you are, a little boy with knives and axes. Yeah, but I, I didn't have a well, my mum and dad bought me an axe for my birthday present. Because you had to borrow them from the scouts. Yeah, so, so for a to, birthday present, they yeah, bought you one. They bought me a so I had my own hatchet. And what did you do with them with these? Well, well the, the knife had a four-inch blade, we saw, and a nice leather handle, handle and yeah. you went and you in had the it on sheet. Your sheath. Okay. And so did the, the, the hatchet you could put on your belt. Right. Because it had a... A little leather, leather over the thing. Over the thing. And what did you use it for then, apart well, from when you were in the scale? Oh, well, another thing we used to do, that happened, it was we always used to get together for, the whole street used to get together for bonfire night in, okay. the, in the field. Cause was, in the middle of this field was a big black patch, and that's where we had our bonfire. Right. Every year. And we built this bonfire, and we used to go all, all over the fields, and all down at our field and look at the trees and any dead wood, we used to chop it off if it was still on the tree or we'd cut it in small places and then we'd bring it back to our bonfire. Right. And, and then we used to start summer holidays. So that would be massive. So, November. yeah, and then people, the whole street would bring out, oh, yeah, their rubbish they wanted to burn sort of thing. So they all got... And Excellent. they got really high. I mean, they were, it was a huge bonfire. A big public space in a way then. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was always, and that was where we used to play cricket oh, in the right. summer as well because most of the field, it would grow up, you know. Yeah. yeah a couple of foot of, yeah. of, of, of grass and all that. But this particular bit was always very short. Well, there's no grass of where the bonfire was, yeah. but it all seemed to affect... A few yards around as well, because we could play cricket there, and they, even the mum, the dads used to come out and play cricket with us. So it was all together. Very but, nice. Um, it was just a thought I, I had. Uh, you, you, what would you say now if someone said, "Oh, I bought my son a hatchet yeah. for his birthday," or "I bought my knife a three-inch sheath knife, a four-inch"? You, you think what? Well, the knife was eighteen. Yeah, but... four-inch sheath knife. Yeah. You know, you think what? Yeah. You think, Are you mental? Yeah. But it was just that's one of those things. Boys, yeah. But do always. You never thought of using it for anything bad. Oh, it didn't enter our. Head. No, we were taught. What to use it for? Ah, oh, right. How to use it? Okay. You don't want to give them a hatch to say go and chop it. No. So we knew what we were doing. Yeah. Good. But um, yeah, and um. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So. What a what a difference. What follows next is yeah. Mm. What a difference. What follows next is sights and sounds of Broadstairs. Oh. Because when we're out and about, we see things, film them, but then also birds that have been in our garden. We didn't have time to put all the birds we've seen in the garden, but we've started. And so we're going to make a little um, film up of that. So that's the film that follows, sights and sounds in Broadstairs. So see you, see you next week. Uh, same place, same time. Enjoy yourself. Bye. Bye. -bye. The lights were dim as